Welcome to this episode of Intellectual Conservatism. Today, I'm here with Rob Coons and Joe Schmid. Um, I've had both gentlemen on the channel on multiple times. Both have been loved and praised by the audience. And so today I thought, well, let's talk about Kalam and causal finitism. So obviously, if you know the Kalam cosmological argument, premise one, whatever begins to exist has a cause. Two, the universe began to exist. And three, therefore, the universe has a cause. Now, there's a question about the second premise on, you know, leaving aside kind of the complicated physics and science arguments, are there kind of philosophical arguments for believing that the universe had to have had a beginning? Um, we can talk about, or maybe a finite series of past causes. Uh, and today I'm having two experts really on the issue of discussing uh, this particular question. And so I just want to put my cards on the table that, you know, I'm a theist, but, you know, if the Kalam succeeds, great. If the Kalam doesn't, Okay, well, you know, let it be, right? I got other arguments that I like. But since I've had Rob and Joe on before, could I have you both just kind of give some updates on your life? So you don't, you don't have to go through your whole background and everything. But let me have uh, Rob go on first and then Joe. Um, yeah, I've been teaching at the University of Texas for, let's see, 34, 35 years now, still plugging away at it, uh, having a lot of fun. Um, we've, got a, we've got a new book. I think you uh, we've talked about this, Sean. Um, uh, a book on classical theism that Jonathan Foucault and I have edited. It's going to be coming out this next year. Um, also been working on Aristotle and quantum mechanics. I've got a, I've got a sort of a slim book on that coming out this year as well with St. Augustine Price. I'm hoping to get some attention there as well. How slim are we talking? <laughs> um, the St. Augustine Press, I think pretty soon, probably um, uh, late spring, maybe right. summer. The other one, I'm not sure. We're still waiting on a couple of chapters on the classical theism thing, but I think mm. I'm hoping late 22 we can get that out. All right. Well, Rob, thank you so much. Joe? Yeah, um, I have, well, most recent news, I just got over COVID, so I'm trying to, <laughs> trying to get over that little hill, but um, but yeah, I've been chugging away at my um, Purdue degree. This is my last semester, so at Purdue. Um, and then after that, it's a gap year and then on to grad school. But uh, in the meantime, I've been publishing lots of papers and whatnot. Um, and I guess most recently and relevantly for this discussion, I have a paper called A Step-by-Step -Step Argument for Causal Finitism. I tried to be cheeky uh, in the title because like my argument is based on a, a principle about steps and going step-by-step -step in certain processes. Um, and that was published in the journal Air Kentness. And I've also been working on different papers, including with like Alex Malpass on um, the Grim Reaper paradox and other sorts of things. So super fun stuff. It's like one of my favorite things to think about because it's like paradoxes and metaphysics and philosophy of religion, philosophy of time. It's just, it's amazing. So anyway, oh, and I guess I should also mention that um, I've got, um, I know Swan and I, we talked about this in our previous previous discussion, but I've got also got a book manuscript under review right now at a press um, on existential inertia and classical theistic proofs. So I go through um, a bunch of different arguments for classical theism, and I look at the metaphysics of existential inertia, basically the first book length treatment of existential inertia, um, as well as looking at different classical theistic arguments. So yeah, fun stuff. Well, Joe, you never fail to impress. And so I'm excited for today's conversation, because uh, it's, I'm going to have Rob lead at least the the conversation at first, and then we might, you know, have Joe come in and well, we'll have Joe come in. But um, mm -hmm. I think the first thing we'll start off with is just Rob giving us uh, the arguments for causal finitism or, you know, the, these type of paradoxes that have been developed. And then we'll have Joe engage them. And then from there, um, you know, I think we'll eventually get to the question, does causal finitism, if true, have any theistic implications or could a naturalist kind of accommodate it? Or I don't know, maybe accommodate's not the most charitable word, but you know what I mean. So Rob, I'll have you go first. Okay, thanks, Juan. Um, yeah, so causal finitism is just the thesis that, I guess necessarily, right? Uh, every effect has only a finite number of causes. So, um, and, and here we don't just mean immediate causes, but uh, in, indirect causes as well. So the, the whole causal history, so to speak, of anything that is an effect, whatever effects are, <laughs> Uh, is going to be finite in um, complexity, I guess you could say. That is the number of things in it <laughs> is, is finite. Um, so, um, so that's the thesis. And um, obviously what that does is rules out causally infinite, uh, infinite causal regresses. And I think would also plausibly rule out uh, causal cycles as well, since that would be I mean, you could argue whether that would count as, as, a, as an finite or infinite, but for our purposes, I guess the infinite regress is the main thing that it's going to clearly rule out. And um, so there's, 
there have been a, a lot of discussion about this in recent years. Um, it goes, I think all this goes back, well, of course, all this back to Zeno originally, <laughs> uh, and there's some discussion of that. But more recently, somewhat more recently, uh, there's a great little book by Jose Benedetti, a philosopher at Syracuse University uh, called uh, Infinity. Yeah, it came out in like 64, I believe, something like that, 64, 65? 64, yeah. 64, yeah. And um, I mean, it, it was certainly well received, but it didn't make a huge splash, I don't think, in 64, but it's becoming more and more talked about, I think. A uh, very rich little book <laughs> full of these fascinating, uh, infinite involving, infinity involving uh, paradoxes. And uh, there's a number of them that would be relevant to causal finitism, actually. Um, and there are others, too, besides the, the darn found in Benedetti's book that are also somewhat relevant. Um, I think we'll maybe start out talking about one of them that comes from Benedetti, which is the Grim Reaper paradox. Um, but then, depending on how things go, we may, we may talk about some of the others as well. Um, the Grim Reaper one is especially, I think, relevant to the question of infinite regresses, actually, because in a sense, it's, it's arguing specifically that uh, there's something impossible about uh, any kind of infinite uh, causal regress. Right? So, uh, so the story, the original, Benedetti's original story involves um, a victim, Fred, I think, and uh, an infinite number of Grim Reapers who are determined to kill Fred. And uh, in De Benedetti's original story, it's all packed in between a, in a single minute, between midnight and a minute after midnight. Uh, but the crucial thing about it is that the, the infinite, infinite number of, of reapers are arranged in such a way that there's a last reaper, temporally speaking, but there's no first re reaper. So reaper number one goes last, right? At, at exactly a minute after midnight, he checks to see if Fred is dead. If he's already dead, if he's already been killed by one of the other reapers, reaper one will kill him finally at 1201. Reaper number two, it's half a minute after midnight, right? That's his deadline. He checks at that time to see if Fred's dead. If he is, he does nothing. If he's not, he kills him. And then three at 15 minutes after midnight, and so on, right? So one over two to the N minutes after midnight, uh, Reaper number N has his deadline, checks to see if Fred is, is alive or dead and, uh, and kills him. And um, so the problem of course, is that you get a kind of, get a contradiction pretty quickly because it's pretty clear that Fred can't survive past minute after midnight, right? I mean, because if he'd survived by some kind of miracle till 1201, one run will kill him, right? So he's, so he's clearly dead after 1201. But, and, and then let's assume this part of the story is that he, he can't die except by being killed by one of the reapers, right? Um, and so he's got, so therefore he must have been killed by one of the reapers, Reaper K, right? But then the problem is if he's been killed by Reaper, Reaper K, that means that he survived K plus one, K plus two, K plus three, and so on. And that's impossible, right? Impossible for the same reason. Well, uh, yeah, impossible because if, if he'd survived till the deadline for K plus one, right? Two over two, uh, one over two to the K plus one, then Reaper K plus one would have killed him, not Reaper K, right? So you get a contradiction, right? Assuming that it was Reaper K who killed him, you get the contradiction. No, it wasn't Reaper K, it was, it was Reaper K plus one. And of course, you know, that's, that's true for any arbitrary K, right? So you get, you get a pretty quick contradiction. Um, so now there are different ways to think about this. Um, I guess I might mention briefly that, you, you know, we could also uh, do this in a way that doesn't pack it all into one minute, right? Uh, I think this is something I suggested uh, in Noose, which is um, suppose we have an infinite amount of time and we give Reaper 1, 1 BC, Reaper 2, 2 BC, Reaper 3, 3 BC, and so on. Now, in this case, we can't really talk about a, a, a a victim, Fred, who's alive before them all, because there is no before. Uh, but we could just suppose that you know they, they're passing a piece of paper between them, among themselves, and uh, Reaper K is supposed to stamp his number K on the piece of paper if it's blank. And if it isn't, he passes it along to the successor. And there are all kinds of variations on this. We can imagine that there's a, a point particle on a plane, right? And uh, if the particle's still on the plane when Reaper K sees it, he moves it off the plane some tiny distance. And if it's, if it's already off the plane, he does nothing and so on. And so again, you get a contradiction, right? Because the point will have to be off the plane at the end of the 1 AD, sure. But if you say, you know, who moved it off the plane and how far did it go, you get a contradiction because it has to be moved by somebody. So that's K, but then K plus one should have moved it. So you get, you get the same contradiction. Okay, so, um, so what's going on here, right? Um, well, when you have a paradox of this kind, 
and the paradox generates a contradiction, then we can always think of the argument, so to speak, uh, that, that's implicit in the, in, the, in the case as a kind of reductio ad absurdum. Right? It's a set of premises which jointly entail a contradiction. Uh, so this is a very familiar idea, right? Because, I mean, Socrates does this all the time in, in the dialogues, right? Uh, uh, Euclid does it a lot. Uh, Euclid proves that there can't be a finite number of, of prime numbers this way, right? He says, suppose there were a finite number of prime numbers, a finite number of prime numbers, right? Uh, let's, let's take the set of all those prime numbers, multiply them all together and add one, right? <laughs> You've got a new prime number that isn't in the set, right? Contradiction. So, uh, so it's a very similar kind of move here. So the interesting question about all these paradoxes is, what's the guilty premise? Right? What I mean, because all the premises that, unless you're unless you're paraconsistent, like uh, uh, Grand Priest or someone like that, we could talk about that, I guess, if you'd like. Um, but for the most part, let's assume that uh, we think that uh, contradictions cannot be true, at least in general. Uh, we've got a valid argument with a, with a contradiction as its conclusion. So therefore, at least one of the premises must be false, right? Because if they're all true and the argument's valid, then the conclusion must be true and the, true, the conclusion is a contradiction that can't be true, right? So that, that's the idea. So the question is, what's the premise? And, and what I did in my, my version of this, I guess it was again in, in News a couple of years ago, 2017, something like that, uh, was I, I, I set out the argument this way, um, hypothesis, it's possible for there to be an infinite causal regress. Right? Um, and you could put this again, you could put this sort of temporally if you want to, the various ways to set that up. Um, second premise, the individual operation of a grim reaper or grim signal or whatever messenger is metaphysically possible. Right? There's nothing impossible about building a machine right, that checks to see if a particular thing has happened, is Fred alive or not, has the paper been written on or not, and then responds in a very simple sort of way to that input, right? That seems metaphysically possible. Third premise, some kind of patchwork principle, which says that if you've got world one, that has a certain kind of temporal or causal structure, right? And that structure is big enough that we could put some number, of, rep, of um, copies of a particular scenario in there. And the scenario itself is, is possible. So each patch is possible. There's a frame that's possible. It's possible that has a large enough frame to put a certain number of copies of that uh, scenario into it. Then there's a third world, right? Possible world in which the frame exists and it's filled with copies of the possible scenario, right? So, um, so that's this is a principle that comes from David Lewis, uh, called the Patchwork Principle. Uh, uses it quite a bit in, in some of his work on modal metaphysics. It's certainly not question begging for a theist to rely on on the principle of uh, on the Patchwork Principle. Lewis was famously an atheist, right? So it's not as though this 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 principle only makes sense from an from a theistic point of view. It makes perfectly good sense from an atheistic point of view as well. He was a polytheist atheist because you know he had a <laughs> realism. So there are infinitely many gods of sorts. All right, not yeah. the actual world. <laughs> yeah, true, true. <laughs> but not not by what I would call it as a god. But that's another issue. Um, right. So 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 the question is, what's the weak link, right? And um, I argue, look, um, if we had strong independent reason to believe that infinite regresses are possible, then we would be forced to say, you know, that there's that this patchwork principle fails in this particular case. For some reason, there's an exception to the patchwork principle. But we have no such strong independent reason. In fact, we have no reason at all <laughs> to believe causal regresses are possible. And we have very good reason to think on any given case that the patchwork principle is probably good, probably okay. We use it all the time in our, in our modal reasoning. So therefore, we should go, we should reject the possibility of an infinite regress. That's the, that's the most reasonable response to the problem. That's, that's basically how I take it. Yeah, so the way that I think about, so, okay, I, I call these Benedetti paradoxes, right? Because they trace back to Benedetti's book, um, yeah. Infinity and Essay in Metaphysics. And I call the class of them Benedetti paradoxes following Nicholas Shackle. Uh, Nicholas Shackle, he's a philosopher, he published in 2005, an article in the British Journal for the Philosophy of Science, entitled um, The Form of the Benedetti Dichotomy. And what he points out is that every Benedetti paradox involves two jointly logically unsatisfiable conditions. 
Um, so Shackle goes on to endorse what he calls the unsatisfiable paradiagnosis as the best response or the best way to kill Benedict paradoxes. And I myself um, lean towards that kind of view. Things get complicated when you bring in other non-Benardetti paradoxes of infinity, but I'm just focusing on Benardetti paradoxes. So those two conditions are entirely abstract. You can characterize them in pretty rigorous logical terms. Um, and I'm going to use my own names for them. I think Shackle calls them the A condition and B condition. I don't like that because it doesn't really, it's not really informative. So I'm going to call them the beginningless condition or the beginninglessness condition. And secondly, the property condition. Okay. So the beginninglessness condition. Informally, this just says that um, there are infinitely many things arranged or ordered in a beginningless way. Now that's a bit too informal because that the notion of beginninglessness here is not temporal. It's a, it's a formal, it's a purely formal or abstract notion. So formally we can put this as there are infinitely many members in a set or collection S such that first S is not well-founded. So that means that S has no first or minimal element. Uh, and secondly, S has a strict total ordering. Okay, so a strict total ordering for the audience on a set, and I'm putting this a little bit roughly since this is for a kind of popular, albeit philosophically inclined audience, um, but a strict total ordering is basically uh, an entire set that is ordered or arranged such that for any two members chosen at random, um, they stand in some particular ordering relation, and that relation that orders it is um, it could be something like earlier than or later than or thinks of or even loves or is caused by or grounds. Uh, it's a purely abstract relation. Uh, and importantly, this relation has to be irreflexive, firstly. So that means it's not the case that X stands in the relation to X. So nothing stands in that relation to itself. It has to be transitive. So if X stands in that relation to Y and Y stands in that relation to Z, then X stands in that relation to Z. And thirdly, it's asymmetric. So if X stands in that relation to Y, well, then it's not the case that Y stands in that relation to X. So that's what a strict total ordering is on a set. So we have, that's the beginninglessness condition. It's an infinite set with non-well-foundedness in a particular direction, and there's an ordering relation on it. Okay, and then we have a property condition. This is the second condition in the unsatisfiable pair. And this just says for any member M of that set, some property or condition or rule P holds at member M, if and only if P holds nowhere before M along the ordering relation in the direction of beginninglessness. And so again, this is not necessarily a temporal before, it's just a purely abstract relation. So in other words, each member M of the set satisfies the following condition. M is P just in case no other member in the direction of non-well-foundedness or beginninglessness is P. Right. And there are so this is a purely abstract way of characterizing it. It's the, it's the form, it's the structure of the Benedetti paradox. And there are countless ways that you can fill this in, right, with uh, concrete details. Benedetti himself, right, he used infinite firing squads, gods erecting impassable walls. Uh, you can use deafening gongs. Um, you can use grim reapers, grim messengers. Uh, you could use it even with sentences. And you, you can, we, we're going to get to that later. Um, but anyway, there are lots of different ways to fill out the concrete structure of this. But what I want to note for the audience here is that this is a purely abstract contradiction in strict logical terms. It has nothing to do per se with causation, time, and so on. You can do it strictly a causally. You can drive the contradiction via logic and so on, because it's just formal features of the situation. And so, um, again, we're going to be focusing on <clears throat> the uh, causal concrete versions of it. But I think that's the best way to set it up because my favorite solution is the unsatisfiable pair diagnosis. So what is that? The unsatisfiable pair diagnosis basically just says that Benardetti paradoxes are uniformly killed simply by knowing that they involve a strict logical contradiction in their very setup. No substantive metaphysical theses are needed apart from debarring the metaphysical possibility of contradictions. Now to illustrate the UPD, uh, I'm gonna give you guys a taxi paradox. Um, so suppose for reductio that Swan can get into a yellow taxi. Okay, now consider the following story. So Swan is in New York. Uh, he's too tired to walk home to his hotel because he just finished a long day of petting cats and debating Protestants. Uh, so Swan gets into a yellow taxi and the taxi drives him to his hotel. So upon arriving at his hotel, he gets out of the taxi into the elevator and he finally arrives at his long awaited room. Swan then decides to make himself a sandwich for dinner. But as he was cutting the bread, God appeared in Swan's room. God believes and reveals to Swan that Swan has never gotten into any primary colored vehicle. The end. Now that's the story. But wait, right? Swan got into a yellow taxi and taxis are vehicles. And so Swan got into a yellow vehicle, but yellow is a primary color. So Swan's gotten into a primary colored vehicle. And yet God told Swan that he's never gotten into a primary colored vehicle, but God can't lie or be mistaken, right? And so 
it follows that Swan actually has never gotten into a primary colored vehicle. And now we've deduced a contradiction. Swan both has and has not gotten into a primary colored vehicle. And from this, we conclude that our original supposition is false. That is, we conclude that Swan cannot get into a yellow taxi. Now, <laughs> I know that's quite silly. Um, we can't conclude from the paradoxical story that I just gave that Swan can't get into a yellow taxi. And I think the obvious solution to this, I think we all just take uh, an obvious solution. Like I just told an inconsistent story. I had two theses in there that Swan got into a taxi and that God revealed to Swan that Swan had never gotten into a taxi, which are jointly logically unsatisfiable. Uh, but we're not going to indict their individual possibility. We just say, no, they're even though maybe each one of them is individually possible, maybe, uh, but they're jointly unsatisfiable. And that's all we need to say for the story. I don't need to say like, oh, it's metaphysically impossible for Swan to get into a taxi or it's metaphysically impossible for God to uh, reveal something to Swan, uh, something along those lines. So that is essentially what the UPDist is, or the, what I'm gonna like causal finitist, when I say the UPDist, that's just someone who thinks that the unsatisfiable paradiagnosis is the best way to go here. And so that's what the UPDist says about Benedetti paradoxes. Um, they're gonna say Swan's getting into a primary colored vehicle. That's like the beginningless condition say, uh, and then God's believing and telling Swan that Swan has never gotten into a primary colored vehicle. That's like the property condition. Uh, we shouldn't blame either of the conjuncts individually for engendering paradox. Instead, we should simply kill the paradox by noting that we've told an inconsistent story. So that's basically um, the, the UPDist response. Now, uh, I'll turn it over to Rob after I just mentioned four brief reasons why I accept uh, the, the UPD or why I think it's the best for Benedetti paradoxes. So um, there are four reasons. First, I think it's much simpler than causal finitism. I think causal finitism is much, much, much more metaphysically robust, entails a ton about the structure of space, time, and so on. Um, so I think it's simple in causal finitism. Secondly, I argue that with respect to Benedetti paradoxes, it has greater explanatory power, greater explanatory power in terms of the depth um, that is illuminating why the paradoxes arise. So it gives us a better kind of a better account of why the paradoxes are indeed paradoxical. And secondly, in terms of its breadth or scope, I think that it actually kills some Benedetti paradoxes that causal finitism can't, namely ones that don't involve causation, like Yablo's semantic paradox, but we'll get to that. Um, uh, thirdly, so that, th those are my first two reasons. It's simpler, it has greater explanatory power. My third reason is just, um, I think that the master argument, what I call it for causal finitism with respect to um, Benedetti paradoxes doesn't work. It's basically what um, Kuhn, uh, Rob just laid out. So if if causal finitism were false, then it would be possible to have uh, some kind of Benedetti paradox, but that's not possible. So causal finitism is true. Um, I reject that because I, you know, uh, we can go into um, Patrick principles there. So that's the third third reason is that I reject the master argument. And then finally, um, I think that there's a, a pretty forceful argument by my light uh, against causal finitism as a solution to Benedetti paradoxes, um, deriving from non-causal Benedetti paradoxes that don't involve causation at all. Um, and I think, well, we can get to that. So those are my, those, those are my four reasons. And I'll just, um, I'll turn it over to Rob, where, where you want to go with this next. Yeah, so thanks for running through that. I have to say that it's still completely opaque to me what in the world this is, the so-called diagnosis is supposed to be. Um, I mean, any sort of reductive ad absurdum, right, is going to derive a contradiction from certain premises. It's always possible to take any argument of reductio ad absurdum, abstract some kind of abstract structure from it, and say, aha, there's the diagnosis of what's going wrong. You, you, made, you, made, you made contradictory assumptions in this argument. Yes, <laughs> that was the whole point <laughs> of making a reductio ad absurdum. So it'd be like, it would be like again, let's, let's bring Euclid into it, right? Uh, Euclid proves that there can't be a, a finite number of, of prime numbers. That's a pretty big deal. Right? President Biden would say a pretty effing big deal, right? That you can show that, there, that there's an infinite number of prime numbers. But the, the unsatisfiable pair of people would say, no, no, you can't get any substantive fact from this. The problem is you put, you're making inconsistent assumptions here, right? Um, you're assuming that you can take, you can, you can gather together all the finite numbers into a set, multiply them together, add one and get a new prime number. Um, that's a contradiction, right? So, so therefore you can't, you haven't shown anything about the number of, of uh, the number of prime numbers, right? All you've shown is, you know, either um, there's um, a fi infinite number of prime numbers, or you can't multiply all the finite, finitely many prime numbers together and add one. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly what he's shown. <laughs> but but now we have to choose, right? What's the most reasonable thing to assume? Is it reasonable to think 
yeah, there's, there can't be an, a finite number of prime numbers, right? Or is it reasonable to think, yeah, maybe there are a finite number of prime numbers, but for some reason it's impossible to multiply them together and get and add one. Well, I think of those two choices, it's clear which way is the reasonable way to go, right? So in this particular case, um, we've got these two or three or four, depending how you count them, premises, right? Uh, that, that are involved in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the, any of the causal Benedetti stories, including the Grim Reaper story, they lead to a contradiction, right? Um, Joe says, yeah, okay, that just shows you, you, know, you, had, you had inconsistent premises in your argument. Exactly, right? So now the question is, and, and here we can't do it abstractly, you have to look at the actual premises. We have to say, okay, in this particular case, which of those premises are we gonna give up? Right? Which one? Which one is wrong? And I think you know, in this particular case, uh, we either have to say there's just an exception to the to the patchwork principle in this case, for some reason, right? Even though it's possible for there to be an infinite regress, and even though the individual patches are possible, we just can't put them together this way. It's just impossible. Or we can say no. The, the you can always, no matter what the structure is, right? Uh, as long as you've got possible patches, you can put them together according to that structure. That, that, that patchwork principle has no exceptions. The problem was assuming that there's a, that there's a possibility of an infinite number of, of uh, causes. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I think it's not really responsive. Um, I also say that, that you know, the, the problem with the, with the abstract way of going here is that it loses the modal aspect of this altogether, right? Which, which is we're really trying to explore metaphysical possibility, not just the actual world, right? But what's, what's possible, right? Um, so sure, I mean, I, I, know, I know that um, in the actual world, right? There can't be the Grim Reapers, that, that's certainly right. The question is what's possible out there, right? Is there a possible world where there are infinite causal regresses? And there are other possible worlds where there's individual Grim Reapers or finite sequences of Grim Reapers, but for some reason, no way to put those together, right? Uh, and I think that that's, doesn't make sense. Right? Uh, much more reasonable to say, there just aren't any possible worlds with infinite regresses. And the patchwork principle has no, no such uh, restriction to it. So I think that's, that, that's I, mean, I just think the unsatisfied pair thing is just a very unhelpful way of, of uh, illuminating the situation. It's just, it's almost as if you know, I gave an argument from which I derived a contradiction. And the answer is you derive the contradiction <laughs> and therefore you can't get any positive, you can't get any substantive conclusion from that argument. Well, you see, okay, sense. yeah, if I, can, if I can jump in. So what it does do is it does reject, you, I could have clarified this. What it does reject is it rejects one of the assumptions that allowed the paradox to arise. In the case of Euclid, right? Um, you have a variety of premises, and you also have a bridge premise that says, let's say, if you have a finite set of uh, natural numbers, then you can multiply them together and add one. Right. So um, the UPDist, with respect and we to- we could reject that if we wanted to. Yeah, yeah, right? you, you could. Um, or we but, could but say that in some worlds it's true and in some worlds it's false, right? We could do all kinds of things like that, but that wouldn't yeah. be reasonable, right? Yeah, well, because we have, you know, axioms of arithmetic and so on. And, you know, we have good reason to believe that. We have good reason to believe that particular bridge premise. But what the UPDist is saying is that in the case of causal finitism, you have a variety of premises, you have uh, an infinite causal chain and so on. And then you have a bridge premise that's saying if, you have, if it's possible for there to be an infinite causal regress, then it's possible to have um, an infinite or a Benedetti type paradox. And you, you, you could use via the Patrick principle to get there, right. for instance. And, that's and much, so, much more helpful than the bridge principle. Bridge principle is not the fundamental assumption. Yeah, yeah, no, I, the patchwork so is. by rejecting, because, well, he, here's what the UPDS does. They reject the, the bridge principle, but what, the, what you do, for instance, is saying, well, hey, if you have the Patrick principle, then you get the bridge principle. And so by modus tollens, they're also rejecting the Patrick principle. So that's where we can go next. So right. UPD does indeed reject one of the, uh, this is my point. The, the right. UPD is not just saying, oh, well, it's just an inconsistency, uh, very, you know, we're done. It actually does reject one of the, um, one of the assumptions that led up to the paradox. So I just wanted exactly. to respond to that. So point. why not put it that way? <laughs> that would be so much more helpful. Just say, forget the unsatisfiable pair nonsense. Just say, we reject the patchwork principle. Okay, here's well, why. We so think reason, it's much weaker than the causal inference. That would be much more helpful. Well, the, the reason comes later when you get to the non-causal Benedetti paradoxes. So that, that's why it was setting it up for that, which I think we'll talk about um, later. But if we can get onto the Patrick principle now, because I think that's, that's a helpful place to start. So yeah. one thing that I want to go with this Patrick principle, and there are there are many different ways to go. Uh, but one thing I want to do is like, um, I think it creates trouble 
Well, I think it would straightforwardly entail that there can't be an endless future, for instance. And I think, um, well, firstly, that's a big no-no for Christianity because we tend to think that there's an endless afterlife in Christianity. Um, and I also think we have good reason to think that um, there could be an endless future. I mean, if we just use some kind of defeasible principles like Josh Rasmussen's modal uniformity principle, we could use um, conceivability, at least as a defeasible guide and so on. Now, you can question those, but um, I think those give us some reason to think, uh, and I could spell them out if we want, but they give us some reason to think that there could be an endless future. So it's problematic. Yeah. Grant if, that. It, yeah. Um, so now let's take um, an endless future as our spatial temporal framework, right? And now we have the following individually possible intrinsic state of affairs. On January 1st, 2023, person P0 is located in, or person P0 in location L thinks a token thought, we're just going to call this Q0, of the following type. So here's the type, it's Q. And oh, I should say, this is from Roy Sorensen, a 1998 paper, uh, Yablo's Paradox and Kindred Infinite Liars, published in Mind. Um, so the following type of thought is Q. Some future person thinks untruths whenever they're in L. Whenever they're in that location L, they, some future person thinks untruths. So that's our individual possibility. This is clearly possible. I can think of that right now in this location here, sitting here. So that's clearly individually possible. We have our spatio-temporal framework of an endless future. And so now let's just duplicate it, just like you did when you're opening statement. Let's duplicate it into an endless future. On January 1st, 2024, uh, person P1 in location L thinks Q sub 1, um, which is another token of that thought. On January 1st, 2025, person P2 in location L thinks Q2. Uh, and then so on. For every N on January 1st, 2023 plus N, person PN in location L thinks Q sub N. Now, consider person I and their thought Q sub I. If Q sub I, if that thought is not true, if it's untrue, well then every person in L, in P sub I's future, is thinking truths, right? Because remember, remember what they're thinking. They're thinking some future person thinks untruths whenever they're in L. So if that's not true, well then that means that every future person, whenever they're in L, is gonna be thinking truths. But their thoughts can only be true if some of their successors are thinking untruths, right? Because that's precisely the content of their thoughts. So we get a contradiction. By contrast, so I just suppose that Q sub i is untrue. Now suppose that Q sub i is true. If Q sub i is true, well then some person in L in P sub i's future, call this person P sub m, uh, is mistakenly thinking Q sub m. But we've already shown that no person can think an untrue token of that Q, right? Uh, and so uh, that's, what, that's what I just showed with Q sub i being untrue. And so we get another contradiction. And hence, whether or not Q sub i is true, we get a contradiction. And so we get a dilemma. Either say the future is necessarily finite or we deny the Patrick principle. Um, and I think that that's pretty bad for Christianity. Um, if we use your Patrick principle that, that you use to uh, engender um, the, the past infinite paradox, well, then we can use the same thing to rule out Christianity, say. Um, and I think that that's problematic. So that, that's one thing that I would say. Uh, that's not, that. that's, I'm afraid that's not gonna work at all for several reasons. Um, so, um, I mean, you're talking to someone who's, who, who, who spent the first 15 years of his career working on the liar paradox. So I know this stuff pretty well, but unfortunately it would take us quite a while to get off on it. Um, pick up my book from 93, where I actually talk about Yablo's paradox and I show that uh, there are all kinds of ways around this, right? Um, the basic problem is, you know, is that there's another assumption, well, several assumptions that this argument needs that aren't, for which there's nothing parallel to them in the Bernadette cases, assumptions involving semantics of truth, right? Uh, assumptions that, you know, basically it's Tarski by conditionals, right? That P is true if and only if P. Um, and we know that that creates all kinds of problems, even when we're not talking about infinite futures or infinite pasts or anything like that. We can create a paradox with two people, right? Thinking about each other, mm -hmm. right? Uh, with a, I, can, I can create a paradox with a single shirt where the one side says what's written on the other on the back is false and the back says what's written on the front is true. Uh, you, you know, you got a, you got a paradox there. It's, it doesn't involve any kind of, uh, you don't need the patchwork principle or, or anything else to get, to get paradoxes there. So I would just say, you know, for the sake of our discussion, any sort of semantic or naive set theoretic paradoxes have to be set aside. Those have their own interesting problems. They're not going to tell us anything about infinite series, whether past, future, or, or, or to the contrary. They're not going to help us. They're not going to be a test case for the, anything like the Patrick Ford principle. So it's, 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 it's completely irrelevant, I'm afraid to say, uh, to the kinds of things we're, we're, we're worrying about right now. Yeah. So um, and I'm so, thinking... I, yeah. So therefore, I mean, I would say in, in contrast, look, we, we have to take 
the patchwork principle seriously, at least as presumptively true in each case, because otherwise there's no way for us to make any kind of judgments about possibility uh, without, without some kind of patchwork principle, because we're always going to be using things, individual things that we know are possible and, and, and we're gonna set them into, into some kind of a framework that we, we believe to be possible in order to construct scenarios. And we do this all the time. So whenever I'm planning how to, how to write a book or an article or how to you know, pick up pizza for dinner, I'm gonna be implicitly using patchwork principles all over the place in order to judge whether a particular set of actions is possible or not. Uh, so so I, 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 think, I think that that kind of use of the semantic paradoxes is really unilluminating again for this this kind of a case. Well, see, what I'm thinking is that um, I think if we grant the individual intrinsic possibility of one of them on which the Tarski schema holds and, and, and so on, right, we can use the Patrick principle to take us from that and we duplicate that, right? So it's it's the Patrick principle that's allowing it. I agree that there are independent problems for it. The thing is, Look, the Patrick I, principle- I know that I can create paradoxical problems. situations. Right, using using I can like I said just said I can I could I could print a T-shirt <laughs> with 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 that embodies you know the liar paradox and there, it would be a real mistake to say oh we just proved that no, such T-shirts are impossible <laughs> because you know because it would lead to a contradiction we know it leads to a contradiction right because because of the uh, the Tarski liar paradox so it does nothing to do with T-shirts and it's nothing to do with with infinite See, series either. that's exactly what the UPD says right we know that that abstract structure has a contradiction in it we can de demonstrate that independently of any causal considerations and any yeah. any so on. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's this strict logical abstract deduction. So there are independent problems for that abstract structure. No. And so you're trying to, you're trying to take <laughs> no, a no, no. principle. No, the, no, no it's not a exactly problem. It's not a problem when you're building a reductio argument to point out that it, there's a contradiction. That's not a problem. That's a feature, not a bug. <laughs> I know, I didn't argument. say it was a problem. Okay, so he, well, here's what I'm thinking. You so said it was. You said it was Let me step in really quick and just, Joe, can you kind of articulate all that you're trying to say, and then I'll yeah. let Rob come in, but just try and, you know, yeah, lay yeah, it out. Sorry, I'm sorry. It was my fault. No, I interrupted. I'll, no, I'll so yeah. As I see it, the dialectic is, um, right, we have an individual possibility. And you take the individual possibility, and we, we can, let, let's start with one case, right, uh, Rob's case. So we have an individual possibility, an infinite causal chain. And then we try to use the Patrick principle to take us from that individual possibility to something that we have independent reasons to think is strictly logically inconsistent. Okay, so we're using that Patrick principle to take us from that possibility to something that we have independent reasons entirely, we have independent reasons to think is impossible. What I want to say is that in the case of many future oriented paradoxes, we take an individual possibility, like me thinking thoughts about some future person, and we use the Patrick principle to duplicate that. And then we get these kinds of contradictions. Yes, we know that there are independent problems with what results from that, but what, what's problematic is you the Patrick principle to take us from the individual possibility, which is indeed individually possible. And then duplicating that, let's say, into an infinite future where we get the kind of paradoxical construction. So what I so, think is that there's a contradiction in both cases, right? We have independent reasons, yes, to think that these sorts of um, paradoxes involving semantics and so on. And actually, uh, Rob, I'm going to let you have the, once I turn it over you, I'll let you have the final word on that because there are non-semantic versions of the, the future oriented Benedetti paradoxes that I, I can run. So I'll let you have the last word on this before I just turn it over to you. Um, and let me just make this one last point. Uh, we know have independent reason for thinking that there are contradictions in both of the cases, the, the semantic case and the, um, the, like the Benedetti paradox. And we use the Patrick principle to take us from some individually impossible, intrinsic, individually possible intrinsic specification of some scenario to get us this kind of absurd situation. And what I wanna say is that, um, at least in, in such cases, perhaps we should either restrict the Patrick principle or um, it, it tells us that there's some kind of problematic application of the Patrick principle to the case at hand. So Rob, I'll let you have the last word on this before we go into non-semantic future-oriented Benedetti paradox. Just, just really quick too, Joe, do you feel like you've exhausted everything you wanted to say on this particular argument or is there anything else you might want to bring in real quick? Any last clarifications? Um, no, I mean, I mean, I no, that's good. I mean, I think I, I I'll just give it Rob to respond sure. to what I said. He can have the last word there, and then I I want to talk about the non-semantic future oriented yeah. ones. All right. So anyway, I think that in the Yablo type cases, the patchwork principle still works just fine, and it would be it would be a bit crazy to think that we could prove that it's impossible to have an infinite series of people thinking these thoughts. That's perfectly possible. 
there's no reason why I couldn't, why the, the story you described couldn't be right. Now, it's true that we get a contradiction from it if we, if we apply naive semantical principles like Tarski's schema. That doesn't prove that the series is false. That shows there's something wrong with the naive uh, Starsky and schema, right? Just as, as, as I showed my t-shirt, right? Where the one side says what's on, this, on the back is true and the back says what's on the front is, is false. I get a contradiction from that. You don't get from that conclusion that such t-shirts are impossible. <laughs> you can make them. <laughs> I've seen them, right? And so, and so, uh, and so just as in, 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 you can't use semantical paradoxes to prove that there's something wrong with those such t-shirts, so too, you can't use those paradoxes to show there's something wrong with the patchwork principle. The patchwork principle just doesn't fail, does not fail in those cases. Uh, what you describe is perfectly possible. It's the only get a contradiction when you, when you naively use Tarski and uh, schemas there. So, you know, yeah, I mean, I, can, I could write in, in, in Wagner 310, I could say whatever's written in, in Wagner 309 is true. While somebody in 309 is writing, whatever is written in, in Wagner 310 is false. That, we can get a contradiction from that. Does that mean that it's impossible to write those two things on those two rooms? No. Right? The patchwork principle works just fine in that case, right? It really is possible to write those three things on those rooms. It is also possible to get a contradiction from those from that story if you use semantics in a naive kind of way. But you don't have to use semantics in a naive way. Buy my 93 book and you'll get the solution. You know, you'll see why the, the kind of Diablo paradox you described is actually possible metaphysically and doesn't produce a contradiction in the right kind of semantical setting. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I think that, I think that that's, that there's something wrong now. I think any kind of future oriented example you're going to give me is going to smuggle causation into the picture in some way, it seems to me, if it isn't semantic in nature. And since we're not talking about time, we're talking about causation here, you're still going to have an infinite causal regress. And so that's, that's the difficulty. I think that's the, good other, the other thing I should yeah, mention go, here go that's on. really crucial is that I'm assuming that causal dispositions are intrinsic. Right. And so, and so if, we, if I describe certain kind of causal uh, structure, that's intrinsic, right? And that's why backward looking regresses create problems, whereas forward looking ones don't, because of the na very nature of causal dispositions themselves. They're sensitive to what comes before them in the series, not sensitive to what goes afterwards. I think that's a, uh, so. There's much more to say on going back to that, but I, I won't, you know, I said, I said, I'll let you get the final word on that, but um, there are some dispositions which are forward looking, namely those of, I think, um, God's knowledge of future events, say, they're, foreknowledge. They're not. What do you think? What do you think for those then? They're not, they're not causally forward looking. I mean, if God has foreknowledge, it's because his eternal states are causally posterior to something that's in the future. Um, and so there's no, there's no causal loop. There's no, there's no uh, funny causal stuff going on. There. Okay. So I, I, yeah, I wasn't, I was just, I wasn't going to get um, a causal loop or so on, but I want to hear what you think about then uh, a non-semantic version of a future oriented one using God's knowledge. So, Won't work. Um, well, I'll, let me just tell the story okay. and then we can, then we can interact <laughs> with it because I, I'm not sure whether or not it works. So I am curious yeah. to explore this with you. So yeah. um, if the future is endless, we could say, and if God exists, which is a fine innocuous assumption here in this dialectical context, well, then let's say God could create one angel on each day of the endless future, giving each such angel a unique natural number in a paper and pencil. Um, the angel created tomorrow gets assigned the number one, the angel created the next day gets assigned the number two, and so on ad infinitum. And then each angel is going to implement the following rule. And this is the same rule as the um, your messengers, you're just reversing the, the temporal direction. So basically, yeah. uh, they're, they're implementing this rule, write my number on the paper, uh, if and only if no later angel does, essentially. And so then how do the angels know how to follow their rule? Well, the story goes, uh, well, because, you know, that would require writing or knowing whether a later angel writes his number. The story goes is that God has comprehensive foreknowledge of the future, or you could say God has timeless knowledge of the future or whatever. Um, index to each of the, the angels or whatever. And hence he knows whether an angel writes their number in the future. And so on the day a given angel is created, God simply reveals to the angel upon its creation, whether another angel will write their number on the paper in the future. And so for this, you can get the, the kind of the Benedetti um, structure and you get the paradox. So, yeah. um, and I, you know, I'll just turn it over to you. What do you think about these yeah. ones that use knowledge? Well, right. I mean, so I think that, I think the most reasonable conclusion is causal finitism. And that puts real, real constraints on God's foreknowledge. So it gives us some interesting theological consequences. It tells us that God can't create a situation like the one you described um, because it would violate causal finitism. 
uh, angel number one's action would depend causally on the actions of infinite number of angels later in time. And that's impossible. And God, even God can't do the metaphysically impossible. Okay, yeah. So um, it's, so it, what I'm thinking is each angel, what they do is dependent on, right, God's revelation. And mm -hmm. are you gonna say that um, God's revelation there is in some sense explanatorily dependent on God's knowledge of the future relative to them? Are you saying that God's knowledge there is causally dependent on the future creatures? So. Mm -hmm they causally explain God's knowledge. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, that's helpful. Um, I think that's right. I don't know how else to make sense of it. Yeah, unless, yeah. I mean, because unless... some people want to use like, um, like some kind of non-causal explanatory dependence or like counterfactual dependence of some sorts. Um, but it's interesting that if this- there is a, If there's a kind of non-causal dependence, then, then the argument's gonna, then I'm, then I'm a non-causal dependence finitist too, right? <laughs> I'm gonna apply the same kind of finitism to any kind of such dependency. Well, the thing is, once you say that, then I, I worry that ju just merely there being an infinite um, future is going to be problematic, right? Because God knows the infinite. God knows everything that's going to happen on every day of the future. So we have infinitely many things causally impinging on God's knowledge state or whatever, right? We have one target state infinitely dependent on infinitely many causes. You, I mean, you said that there were causes. So if there's an endless future, then we automatically, ipso facto, it seems, have a violation of causal finitism because God's knowledge state is dependent, one state dependent on infinitely many things. Uh, namely, each of the, each of the days, what happened, like the truth is about what happens on each of the days, say. Yeah. Okay. So this is going to force us. This is going to force us to go off into the world of of classical theism a bit, which I was, I was trying to avoid. Um, but um, but of course, strictly speaking, uh, I don't think cause, God is is causally affected by anything. But um, it is possible for him to make some early events causally dependent on future events. That's what he does when, when prophecy happens, right? Uh, when Isaiah tells the people that Cyrus is gonna release you from captivity, uh, God is causing some future event there to, to affect an earlier event, right? And God can certainly do that to some extent, but what he can't do is produce a situation where an infinite cascade of future events is going to affect some past event. That he can't do. And he himself is not affected at all by any of this, and so he's not affected by all the infinite things going on in the universe. He's, he's internally not affected by them at all. So I think I can hold to a pretty strict, and partly because I'm a classical theist, I can hold a pretty strict causal slash explanatory finitism right across the board. So um, does that mean that God can't, um, let's say, reveal to a creature, let's say today, uh, that nothing Nothing, no event of a particular kind will happen in the future, because that would seem to require knowing like on each day, let's say of the future, like, like that would seem to require the kind of infinite dependence that you want to debar, right? I mean, yeah. and like, it, it would surely- He can do that only if he's somehow determined, you know, or, or there's a causal mechanism that determines that such thing will not happen in the future. He can't do so in such, he can't, if, if there really were the chance of uh, at any point in the future that not happening, then yeah, he can't, he can't uh, tell us that uh, those, those future chances are not going to be realized. Okay, so. Yeah, if you don't mind, I'll just step in really quick because I know like, you know, we're, we're getting onto classical theism now and I know, Joe, you were proposing this as like a kind of analogy um, or, you know, a way of approaching the causal finitism question. But of course, you know, this is getting pretty deep uh, or in the weeds, so to speak, right? I mean, so we could continue down this track or we could maybe switch to the other question that's on the table, unless you have any more paradoxes you want to hit, Joe, or Rob, I mean, do you have something to say? a lot more time on that too. I mean, there are there are ways to um, evade the uh, unsatisfiable pair argument, I think. And uh, so maybe we should talk about that a little bit. Um, so for instance, here's a setup which, which would not uh, fall prey to the unsatisfiable pair diagnosis, right? So in this setup, it's just like the Benedetti setup, except there's a coin that's flipped. If the coin comes up heads, then the uh, Grim Beaters get instructions which say, follow the paradoxical Bernadetti instructions. If it comes up tails, they get instructions that say, don't do anything at all, just sit there, right? So that whole setup does not entail a contradiction because if the coin comes up tails, then all the people get these non-paradoxical instructions and everything's fine, right? So according to you, there should be a possible world where that happens, right? 
but there won't be a possible world where the tail, where the coin comes up heads, right? Because that would be that would be paradoxical. But that leads to a problem already because we can we can stipulate that the coin is a fair coin, that it's got a 50-50 chance of coming up heads or tails, right? And now we get a contradiction at that level because if you know the, it's a, there's a 50% chance the coin comes up heads. There's also a 0% chance the coin comes up heads, right? Because whatever is impossible has to have measure zero. And so, so what we would end up with is a situation where if there's an infinite regress, it's possible. Then in that situation, we can't apply probability to it in the appropriate sort of way. We get a contradiction, we try to apply pro probability to it. And so that I think would evade this, this worry altogether, but it would clearly show that there's something still something fishy about infinite regresses. Yeah, so um, it's interesting because Wade Tissamer has a similar kind of idea with um, an eternal society and they're like flipping coins. And one thing that the UPDS could say in that regard is to say, um, you basically just get a, a UTDS, the unsatisfiable triplet diagnosis, where if this coin is truly indeterministic, um, if it truly can go both ways, well then to say, it's just, get, it's just adding an extra specification in there that um, if it's an indeterministic coin, well then, hey, it could have always landed, let's say, the t I forget which one you, you had, but maybe tails, and that would be the, you'd get the, the Benedetti type paradox there. Um, it would be similar if I added into my swan story with the taxi thing, um, some kind of third element, which uh, even though the first two weren't contradictory, you add in the third one and then it gets to the, to the contradiction. Um, and I mean, uh, Alexander Proust, he also- There's no has... contradiction though, to, between an indeterministic coin unless you bring in probability theory, right? There's no contradiction between saying there was this indeterministic coin yeah, you're, that could. You're right, I was, so I was operating with uh, probability theory as like necessary truths uh, in, in the back, just applying across the board. Um, yeah. So you're correct that right. you'd have to add that one in. I mean, Proust right. also has uh, scenarios where um, basically you have the infinitely many like uh, Grim Reapers into like a dense time and yeah. they're arranged beginninglessly, but there's one that's like 10 minutes beforehand there, right? So there's one that's 10 minutes beforehand and he's actually he's gonna kill the, the thread or maybe place the point size particle. All the other ones are gonna wake up and just do nothing, right? So there's nothing like that. And then it would seem as though you could just, you know, flick a switch and this guy would go over here and then you get the, the contradictory setup. So Bruce kind of argues that as well. And that kind of gets into the mysterious force objection. But um, yeah. what I, what I he's, say- he's, like, he's got one too, where, where the, there's an infinite number and they get an in, they indeterministically get a time assigned to them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, between 12 and 1. And it turns out that the probability is 1 that you'll get a paradoxical arrangement. But there's, a, but there's still possible that they would get a non-paradoxical arrangement, right? That there'd be a first one, you know, and nobody before him, and there's no problem. And so the setup, per se, is, is still logically possible. It's, it's not going to derive a contradiction uh, unless, you, unless you add in the assignments of global probabilities. Then you get a contradiction. Um, so yeah, so now you're saying that you know it's it's not it's not enough that um, that we get a contradiction from the description of the setup, but we get a contradiction from the, from the description of the setup and the attempt to uh, to apply probabilities to the setup in a consistent way or in a coherent way. Yeah, I mean, I guess it kind of depends on your views of um, probability and how that applies to the world and so on. Like, I I think it's. Um necessarily the case that it would like these probabilities would already have to apply to anything if it's an infinite causal chain or so on like the, the um, axioms of probability theory and the kind of as you were just talking about the global probability distribution so for me that was just kind of operating in the background uh, as kind of um just a pre-given uh, i wouldn't want to jettison that and i wouldn't call that into question um so and, and other people might might take a different different route there i mean i guess okay so just to, if we could shift gears with respect to the um uh, the Patrick principle, as you probably know, Proust thinks that theism has to include some kind of provisos in there, um, because you could take an individual intrinsic possibility in a space-time region of someone experiencing horrendous evil. You could take as your Patrick world, maybe an empty universe, say, um, even an empty, uh, you know, temporal sequence, uh, and then you just patch in all that evil, and then there's no like outweighing goods because all you're doing is you're patching in the evil and so on. It would seem as though a perfect being wouldn't allow that world to obtain. Uh, and so you have to use theism to get a kind of restriction on the Patrick principle. So I'm wondering what you think, and this is something that Alex Malpass has, um, has mentioned in a recent, uh, I actually forget where he mentioned it. It might've been a personal message to me, so I, I forget. Um, what he said yep. is that if you can use theism to have as uh, like a restriction on Patrick principles, he said like surely it's like even more innocuous to just have like 
no strict logical contradictions as a, as, a, as a restriction on your Patrick principle as well. So yeah, when you use a Patrick principle, um, you have a good reason to think that what your patched in world, like the, the quilted world, you have a reason to think that that's possible, provided that um, you know, you're not violating all these stuff about theism, but also you know that uh, there's not like an independently derivable contradiction in the world that you just created. So there's a kind of restriction in the Patrick principle that you have to build in for theism. Uh, and what Alex says is that why not then also have a built in a restriction just debarring contradictions. So um, like when I patch together, that, that would allow us at least to keep the Patrick principle for every day because there's no contradiction like my, uh, <laughs> my cup being like over here say um, when it wasn't. So I'm wondering what you think about that move. Yeah, no, I, okay, so a couple of things. Um, first of all, yeah, there, there are gonna be um, exceptions in a way to the Patrick principle, I, I grant that. But whenever there's an exception, there's some kind of causal explanation as to why there's that exception, right, so to speak. And of course, on our view, God exists necessarily. He has certain attributes necessarily. That's going to constrain this, the world of possibilities, uh, causally to constrain the set of possibilities, right? So if you can come up with a similar kind of explanation, right, a kind of, again, kind of force that somehow prevents uh, things from being organized in a, in a paradoxical sort of, in a, Grim Reaper kind of way, uh, causally, then I'd have to consider that as an alternative. But to appeal to just contradictions, no, that again, that's missing the point. <laughs> uh, you know, it, it, the, there is contradictions. Avoiding a contradiction is no restriction on on the Patrick principle at all, right? That's not a restriction of the Patrick principle. Um, the point is that when you combine the Patrick principle with certain absurd hypotheses, right, you get contradictions. Right, and that shows the absurd hypotheses, like the infinite causal regress, that they're that those are problematic. Right, um, the Patrick principle by itself doesn't produce any contradictions. Right, and so and so there's there's <laughs> there's no such thing as a kind of restricted Patrick principle that says don't don't include contradictions. No, I mean, of course not. Right, um, we're, we're all granting <laughs> that contradictions are impossible. Right, so that's not an alternative to the to the uh, causal finitist answer so is your approach to like make um so is your approach to make it defeasible the the patrick principle and it's defeated if you have for instance theistic considerations and so on is that is that what your idea because or yeah, do you i mean it's defeasible in, in the sense that yeah if, there, if there's a causal mechanism there that explains why certain combinations are impossible then then they're impossible right so what if we have uh See, I'm just thinking, like, what if we have a non-causal explanation of why certain arrangements are impossible? Well, I mean, you'd have to tell me what that kind of explanation is, right? Um, well, now we're getting tricky because we're getting into the nature of explanation, right? So, like, um, I think, yeah. uh, I mean, it's plausible that 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 um, the derivation in the abstract uh, UPD seems to be explanatory as to why you can't have, for instance, uh, a concrete instantiation of that. There, that, that's it all explains you need. You why this. you can't have both an infinite regress and the patchwork principle, right? Uh, applying without restrictions in particular cases. Yes. That's that's. Yeah, well, that's the result in the, the quilted world. <laughs> it explains why you can't have the quilted world. So it's a non-causal explanation of why you can't have the quilted world. You have a causal explanation of why we can't have the quilted world. Namely, God would not allow all that gratuitous evil, right? So that's a that's a causal explanation of why you can't yeah. have the quilted world. But what's if you can have a causal explanation of that, why can't we have a non-causal explanation in terms of that um, abstract derivation, that, that logical structure of the quilted world? I mean, that's a non-causal explanation as to why you can't have that. It involves... Um, it involves two jointly... It, it's just like the Swan case, right? Uh, the Like there are... I just involve two strictly logically incompatible theses. Um, that, I mean, we seem to have a non-causal explanation there. You have a causal no. explanation, but why should we prefer one over the other? Or why should we privilege only allowing causal explanations to allow us to kind of um, defeat the application of um, the Patrick principle rather than a non-causal explanation? Okay, let's see if, we can try, if I can try to explain this. Um, the Patrick principle says, really, I would say, in the absence of some causal explanation to the contrary, right? If you have this framework and you have these possible situations, you can arrange them in this way, right? So the Patrick principle, I think, it's in, in any sort of modal principle is going to say, if there's some kind of causal rule or law or something that prohibits something from happening, 
then um, then yeah then then uh, then a particular scenario or a set of scenarios won't won't be possible, right? But if there's no such constraint, right, and you have and you have a and you grant that it's possible for there to be this infinite regress, right? Then you then you get a contradiction, right? That, that's the idea, right? Um, because you've got to um, uh, You've got now no explanation for why we can't apply the patchwork principle in that particular case. Right? Um, yes, it gets. A, yes, it re, it yields a contradiction if certain hypotheses are added to it. Right? That's right. Right. You know? Okay. Yeah. And that shows that those hypotheses are impossible. Right? So. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I think that's it. Well, um, like I guess I. So, so here we have a we have the framework, right? Isn't uh, let's say the framework world, whether it be finite or infinite, right? This is the and we'll just say it's like an empty universe, and then we have the individual possibility, which is like the the horrendous suffering or something like that, and then we use the Patrick principle, uh, or we try to use the divisible Patrick principle, and we try to populate that world with uh, just this endless horrendous evil. Now, what you want to say is, okay, well. We actually have a non-causal explanation, or sorry, we have a causal explanation of why that quilted world, the resultant world, is, is not, after all, possible. And so we have, in the, it was a defeasible principle, but we have a defeater in this case, because there's a causal explanation for why you can't get the quilted world. We're not really adding anything to the, to the Patrick principle there. What I want to, what, or what I'm suggesting the UPD is saying, again, I'm, I'm, we're at the edges of my thought here. So I'm not like, I'm not trying to like dip, bury a flag and be like, try to carry it or anything. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> uh, what, what the UPD is going to say is that, okay, we have a framework world. There are infinitely many causal nodes in it. Okay. And now what you're wanting to do is you're wanting to use a defeasible Patrick principle uh, and take an individual possibility of, let's say, Grim Reaper doing its operations or whatever. And you want to populate that world, populate those causal nodes in such a way as you have that duplicated that reaper infinitely many right. times. Right. Um, and what the, the UPDS is going to want to say there is that, well, just as you had a causal explanation of uh, the, like you had a causal explanation for why the quilted world cannot come to be. And that's what provides a defeater for the application of the Patrick principle. There's a non-causal explanation for why you can't have that quilted world. And that gives a defeater for your application of the Patrick principle. It's not as though no, we're like, um, that's the not Patrick right. it's, you're not adding anything to the Patrick principle there. You're just recognizing that it's defeasible and we have certain explanations for when it is defeated. You have a causal explanation. What I'm wondering is no. why, why does a causal explanation serve as a defeater for it, but a non-causal explanation doesn't serve as a defeater for it? Well, maybe there are some non-causal defeaters, but what you described is not a defeater at all, right? Because the contradiction tells us that the disjunction or the, it tells us the conjunction is false. The conjunction of the possibility of an infinite regress and the Patrick principle in this particular case, right? The unrestricted Patrick principle, right? That's all it tells us. It doesn't tell us why the Patrick principle fails. It only tells us you have to choose between this hypothesis or the Patrick principle being unrestricted, right? And so, look, in that situation, you should always reject the hypothesis because you have no explanation for why the Patrick principle would fail in this particular case. Right? You only have logic telling you, you must choose between the unrestricted Patrick principle or this hypothesis in this particular case. There's just no reason to prefer to say, we're just gonna carve out an exception from the Patrick principle with no reason whatsoever in order to save this other hypothesis for which we have no independent reason to believe it to be true. Yeah, see, what I'm, well, I think this might depend on uh, what you think about the nature of explanation. And, uh, and you're saying like, there's no reason there. I mean, there seems to me to be a reason in the quilted world, independently of considerations about Patrick and, and so on. Like, what, I can explain why such a world is impossible, just to, or maybe, no, maybe we could take you the have to, You'd have to provide us with really compelling reason to believe that these infinite regresses are possible, right? If you could provide me with that, plus the unsatisfiable diagnosis fact, then you'd have an explanation for why there are these exceptions to the, to the patchwork principle. But if you don't have any basis for that, then you haven't got an explanation. Okay, so then um, in the case of theism, does that mean that you would already have to have, um, like, let's say, independent reasons for thinking that, um, you know, uh, God exists and couldn't allow such a gratuitous 
situation to obtain. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So in order to run your argument for theism, you already have to have independent reasons for theism, right? Because no, no, you're no, using no, no, you're no, using no. the Patrick principle. No, no, no. And I no, we were talking, talking about two different it. things there. Not, you switched us, you switched from the argument for causal finitism to this question about whether it's possible to have a world where there's endless pointless suffering. Well, that's because I use the Patrick principle that you were using. <laughs> and I, so he, here's the way I'm thinking about it. So look, you have, you have to be a principle. theist to explain why there wouldn't be infinite suffering as possibility. Yes, I think that's right. You don't have to be a theist to use the argument to get to causal finitism. Well, the thing, oh, so here's, here's what I'm thinking, because this is a tricky dialectic, right? Um, the, no, you're using the Patrick <laughs> principle here. And then what I'm thinking is, well, like, hold on a second. If we can use that Patrick principle in that case, like now I'm going to think of some other ways that I can use the Patrick principle. And I'm going to think, oh, here, here's a really sad way that I can use the Patrick principle. Uh, you know, it's like a, a three-year-old who's like um, torturing, a, <laughs> you know, like, uh, um, uh, like bugs, like I'm going to use the Patrick principle to make a world where it's just, you know, endless suffering or something like that, like horrendous suffering. Um, and the thing is, like, it seems to me that, well, I mean, we already grant that um, plausibly God wouldn't allow such a, a world to obtain. And so that would by itself seem to be like you have an argument for causal finitism here. I now have an argument against against theism because uh, I just use this Patrick principle it gives me the feasible reason to think that this is possible. And so someone would have to have independent reasons to think that theism is true in order to uh, defeat that application of the Patrick principle. But it's like, once you recognize that, and once you recognize that using this Patrick principle in order to avoid an argument against theism uh, arising wait, from it. Wait, it's not an argument against theism, right? I mean, we could both agree that if there were no God or nothing like God, then it would be possible to have a world where there was nothing but endless suffering, right? pointless suffering. So we agree with that, that. Right. So the only question is, is that true? Right. Is there, is there a God or not? If it turns out there is a God, then, of course, that won't be possible. So, yeah, there's, well, there's no argument against us, God there. I don't think. Well, if Patrick Principle gives us defeasible, and now we're getting into the nature of defeasible reason, if, if it gives us defeasible reason to think that once we have an individual possibility and we have a framework world, um, we once we have that, we have some defeasible reason to think that the, the quilted world is, is indeed metaphysically possible, then we do have a defeasible reason to think that that's metaphysically possible. Since yeah. that metaphysical possibility strictly entails the non-existence of God, we have defeasible reason, arguably, in favor of the non-existence of God. So in order to avoid that, um, it seems as though you would already have to have independent reasons for theism. And now, relying on the Patrick principle in this context, uh, in using it as like a, a case for causal finitism, it seems, um, we're already going to have to sneak in, or we're already going to have to have um, independent reasons for theism in order to in order to run that kind of argument, or at least that's what that's the way I'm seeing it right now. Um, and I'm okay, so I'll let you have the final word here again before we turn in maybe for the last 20 minutes to stage two. So I will uh, again, I'll let you have the final word here. I'm fine with that. Um, and then Swan, we can move on. Yeah, sure. So I'll let Rob have the last word. But Joe, I do have a question on, on about this particular objection, but I'll let Rob go first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um... Just, I, I mean, I might grant that there's some kind of defeasible argument there against God, and that you might think, well, I mean, there's something to be said about the conceivability of such a horrible world, and that could be some reason to think it's possible, but then if God existed, it would be impossible. So yeah, there's, there's maybe a, 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 an argument there, but it's pretty easily defeated, actually, right? Because the Patrick principle is, I think, always presupposing that there's no underlying causal mechanism that would prevent the patchwork from the, the frame from being filled in a certain way, right? And so as soon as you introduce that possibility, then there's no, then, then of course all bets are off, right? Whereas in the case that we're considering with the, with the Grim Reaper, right? Um, the atheist has no underlying causal mechanism, right? And so, and so it really does, so the, the, the logical contradiction again, all that does to us, for us is force us to choose between one hypothesis, namely that, that infinite regress is possible, and the idea that there might be exceptions, otherwise unmotivated exceptions, right, in the absence of any kind of causal mechanism to the patchwork principle. And so that's the fundamental choice I think we have to make. Um, and look, I could see someone reasonably thinking, gee, I just, uh, I'm going to go with the, with the exceptions to the, to the patchwork principle there. But I think if, if, you, if we think about it, if we reflect on it carefully, uh, we'll see that that's actually a pretty easy choice. We should we should give up the the very implausible hypothesis there instead. Yeah, I'll just toss out my question. And we'll move on to the second kind of section that we were going to get into, which is, okay, 
let's just suppose now that causal finitism is true. What theistic implications, if any, follow if it is the case? And I'll actually have Joe kind of lead with his thoughts on this, and then I'll have Rob kind of give whatever his feedback is. Yeah, so it's difficult for me leading this one is like, uh, you know, it's like whether or not it has theistic implications. Like I'd have to see the argument for whether or not there's a theistic implication and then sort of evaluate that. Um, I mean, that, so it's sort of difficult to, um, to lead this one, but I guess I'll give a few general remarks. Um, right, one thing that we can initially think, um, and uh, well, anyway, one thing that you might initially think is like, hey, um, if causal finitism is true, necessarily every causal chain is uh, finite in the hmm, causal direction, like the way of the, the causes rather than the effects. And if that's the case, well, then there's at least one uncaused first cause, okay? That you, you'd get that. Um, and let's just suppose that, uh, you know, the past is finite. Let's suppose that. And uh, let's suppose that there is exactly one uncaused first cause, right? Well, you might have some kind of, or naturalists might try to give some kind of proposal for that. Maybe just, you know, broad sketches. Maybe there's some kind of... Um, I don't know, found, and again, this is for naturalists. I'm not a naturalist, so the, this is their problem. Um, but uh, the one thing that you might say is, hey, there's some kind of um, foundational quantum field that maybe uh, exists at the first instant, or maybe it's timeless sans the beginning of metric time and temporal since, kind of using Craig's view. Maybe it exists in a, in a non-metric time, in a metrically amorphous time prior to creation, uh, creation and then it like indeterministically has some kind of quantum event and then the reality unfolds that might be a kind of Swinburne Paget Ryan Mullins view um you could take a non-theistic approach to that um or um Oppie likes this approach I don't um but you could say that maybe uh this quantum thing itself begins to exist uncaused from nothing um I don't I, I don't like that approach uh but uh uh, you, I guess that's one other conceptual possibility for the naturalist. Um, and so these are some of the possibilities for what the naturalist might say. Um, what might that entity be? It might be some kind of quantum field. It could be, um, uh, it might even be that time is non-fundamental and there is this fundamental uh, non-temporal, non-spatial temporal uh, universal wave function. I know Alyssa Ney and Jill North and um, a bunch of other philosophers of physics have been working on um, a view called atemporal wave function monism on which there's this sui generis physical object which is non-spatial temporal that functionally realizes or maybe causes or maybe uh, somehow grounds non-fundamental spatial temporal reality and there are actually interesting physical results that uh, lend some support to that um, but anyway my point here is just that at least prima facie right from the armchair it seems like there are a lot of naturalist proposals that are prima facie consistent with causal finitism. So that's, that's, I guess, what I would say, putting on the table first. Um, and uh, yeah, and I mean, I, again, I, there are some that are better than others. Like, I don't like the one where something comes into existence uncaused. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I'll turn it over to Rob. Yeah, I think that's a good, a good summary of some of the options the naturalist has. Um, I mean, um, so I guess I'd say right off the bat, um, causal finitism is neither necessary nor sufficient for a successful natural theology, right? Um, there are lots of good arguments for God that don't rely on causal finitism, and uh, and you need a lot more than causal finitism to get to anything like God. So it's neither necessary nor sufficient. Having said that, it does take away one of the atheist's favorite options, right? <laughs> historically. Uh, atheists have always loved the idea that there might be an infinite causal regress. And, well, and it's philosophically... Away. I just want to say it's philosophically interesting in its own right, causal finitism. Like if it's if it's oh, yeah. true, and you know we have arguments like that's that's something to celebrate in its own right. If it's true, oh, absolutely, yeah, oh, absolutely, yeah. And you know even among theists, it's interesting, right? As, as we just mm -hmm. discussed, you know, if I'm right, it tell, it has all kinds of um, implications for divine foreknowledge, things like yeah. that, which you might not have realized. So again, you know, even quite dependent of whether God exists or not, right? Even if you assume there is a God, this actually puts a lot of constraints in a way on what kind of universe God can create and sustain. And that's pretty interesting in and of itself, right? So yeah, so I mean, exactly. Um, even if the, even if natural theology were never an issue, so it'd still be really fun to think about it and to work on and important to work on. Um, yeah. Um, so I mean, gosh, I mean, to go any further, we, we'd immediately have to yeah. turn a big corner and start talking about, I guess, I guess the question now would be, what are uncaused causes like, right? What would they have to be like? Right. Uh, and then that raises interesting questions about, you know, what cause, what, if anything, can we say about the scope of causation? Is there, is there a kind of 
metaphysically grounded causal principle, right? So I've written a lot about this, right? And so my present view on this is that um, uh, we want to assume, we should assume, that anything that's causable has a cause, right? Uh, that it's causability is the crucial issue here. Uh, because if, and, and in a way you could just say a brute, a brute fact, right, is a fact which is causable but uncaused. And we don't want, we don't like brute facts. We should avoid them as much as possible, right? And so, and so if, if that's right, then an uncaused cause would have to be uncausable, right? And, and then we could, then of course we'd have to think about what does that involve? Right. Um, so on some views that would involve this being being um, in the first moment of time or being timeless in some sense, that seems plausible to me. It seems quite plausible to think it would be a necessary being. I think any sort of, you know, we could go into this, but I think it's very plausible to think that if a being is contingent, then it's at least in principle causable. And so then it would be disqualified. So it would have to be like a metaphysically necessary being. And uh, you know, then depending on how deep you want to go into this, right? I mean, I find the kind of stuff that Aquinas does in Dante at Ascentia on being in essence really interesting. And he says that, look, anything whose essence isn't its very existence would be causable. And so if that's right, that gets you to a being whose, whose essence is its own existence, uh, which is really interesting. It's not, it's, interestingly, it's not the idea that it's a being whose essence entails its existence. Because in a way, that's sort of an uninteresting thing. Um, yeah. You might argue that my essence entails my existence, right? <laughs> because if I, if I exist, I exist, right? Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, so, God, so it's a much stronger claim than that. This is a claim that the, the very essence of God is his existence, right? And so, um, and so that means that you can't even, if that were true, the very idea that such a being would be only possibly existing would make no sense because for it to be possibly existing, its essence would have to be unactualized. But that would, be, that would mean it somehow separated from its existence, but it is its existence. It can't be separated from existence. So, uh, so anyway, that, you know, so, so those are some of the, that's just kind of sketching some possible ways one might go, which would be, you know, if any of them work, would lead to lots of interesting conclusions about what the uncaused being would be like. Yeah, and I mean, if I could add a few things in here. Um, so, my kind of, at least tentatively, my favorite proposal for um, demarcating what plausibly, I know you like the scope of the causal principle, right? Um, my favorite way, or at least the way that I kind of lean towards is um, uh, at least with respect to concreta, probably contingent and necessary things. I, if I were a naturalist, I would say they should go with that necessary foundation. Uh, the initial causal thing should be yeah. um, necessary. In fact, I mean, I like branching views and modality. I know you kind of like them, the kind of Aristotelian causal powers based views and modality. And yep. you kind of get that for free if you have an uncaused thing. Uh, suppose it's contingent. Well, then go to the world in which it doesn't exist. Uh, the only way that our world could be possible from that world is by means of some kind of causal branch. Uh, and so it would actually not be possible for it to be uncaused from yep. the perspective of that world. But surely whatever is actual is necessarily possible. And so you can get um, that you can get that uh, this uncaused thing must be necessary if you have this branching view of modality. Um, that's right. And I mean, that's I think that's the best view of modality. And so yeah. um, I think that just, actually is Aquinas' third way. Really? Um, yeah. Uh, Dan Bonovac and I are working on a paper on this, a chapter on this, to show that oh, that, yeah. that I, argument you just gave is actually there in the third way. Yeah, uh, that's people interesting. People have because... been completely misunderstanding it for a couple hundred years. So, yeah, so several yeah. Years. that's funny because um, I watched one of his videos on the third way that he made like, a year ago or something like that. Mm -hmm. And like, yeah, he does give a kind of almost like S5-ish kind mm -hmm. of a rendition. And it's pretty cool. Um, so yeah. I think that's pretty interesting. Because you look at the Latin, he doesn't say anything about time. All the translators drag all this time stuff into the third way, but he doesn't say anything about it at all. I've heard that it. what's been translated to time could actually be understood as case or situation. Yeah. I've heard that as well. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So that's interesting. Um, but yeah, like I would want to say that it's necessary. And I should I want I think naturalists should say that as well. And I yeah. mean, then you I mean, what they would have to contest with is what you've said you've written about like um intrinsic boundaries and things like that and limits. So I think mm -hmm. that's where a lot of the debate should be going on, I guess going forward. Um, because that's that's stuff is interesting. And I myself would try to like resist the move to saying that's where we should um, demarcate it. But it's philosophically significant there that I lean towards a kind of contingency demarcation. Um, and I think that, you know, that's a, at least it gives you some good resources and, and principled reasons for, for uh, demarcating it there. Um, 
But uh, I, I guess one final thing before we go, and this is not this is not a gotcha question. I am just curious. But with respect to like the intrinsic, um, like non metricality and the intrinsic boundlessness that, that you kind of write it write about in your um, Phil studies paper with Proust. Um, does that like how do you how do you view that with like the Trinity? I know the I know the Trinity is like difficult like in its own right, but like does that seem to you to be an intrinsic boundary or like I, I mean there's some kind of metricality there. It's three. It's not four. It's not two. It's not seventy. Um, so it's there seems to be some kind of metricality there. And what the naturalist might say again, I'm not trying to push this as a gotcha because uh, I'm just curious what you want to say. But what the naturalist might say is like, hey, if you get to have an intrinsic boundary in that regard or some kind of intrinsic metrication, why can't I have some kind of intrinsic metrication? Um, so I'll just turn it over to you and we could probably end there. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you know, if if the Trinity were three parts of God or even three features that God has or something like that, then I think we'd be in big trouble. Um, but I've, um, I've got a paper on this, uh, came out in religious studies a couple years ago. And um, I think it's, I don't know, there are different ways of putting it, but I think the threeness comes from the fact that God is relational in his essence. So his essence is one of being a knower slash lover slash maker. So oh, you talked about this with Ryan Mullins on my channel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, and so you get, you get sort of three qua objects. Uh, God qua knower, God qua known, and God qua knower and known simultaneously, and so, and so you, you sort of derive the threeness from some very basic facts about binary relations, and just the idea that God is this simple binary relation. Um, now, um, in, in a way, I think one could push back and say, okay, that sounds kind of like a modalist view, right? Um, it's not exactly, I think, because I think the kind of modalism that's heretical would say that there are these, 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 that there's these three qua objects which relate to us. So we think of God in these three ways. And so that, that's a kind of creature dependent modalism and that's heretical. But to say that God thinks of himself in three ways, so to speak, uh, necessarily, eternally, that I think is not heretical. Uh, and so, um, and so it, it, it uh, yeah, I, th I think it, it doesn't get me into the kind of question. And, and at least if, there's, if, if this works, there are no arbitrary measures or boundaries there. It, it kind of flows naturally from, from God's essence. So yeah, just, just quickly, um, arbitrary, do you mean um, there isn't some kind of deeper explanation? Is that what you mean? Um, yeah, I mean, that, well, I mean that there is an explanation for why it has to be exactly three. Yeah. Yeah. So um, non-arbitrary would be there is arbitrary. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. 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 Right. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Okay. See, what I'm wondering then is like, even if the naturalist can't like spell out the explanation, they might say, well, whatever metrication there is in that first, uh, in the first cause or whatever, um, there yeah. is some kind of more fundamental explanation for it, um, even if we can't kind of give that. Um, but you know, yeah. the debate, the debate's going on. I just want to say to the audience, like, this is where, this is where yeah. the, the literature should go in the future. I know you've noted this, Rob, but like, Stage two needs to be given a lot more attention in the literature, and like this is a cool area that people should explore. Yeah, I agree. I think I think hopefully that will happen. Yeah. All right. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for coming on to my show. Uh, I just want to mention a few things real quick. So, Rob, I had a uh, some Dominican retired Dominican friars uh, watch my YouTube channel, and one of them was named Father Ed in Saint Pius V uh, down in Chicago, and uh, Father Ed said, "You know, Swan." I really enjoyed listening to Rob Coons, but I had no idea what was going on. <laughs> and so, you know, <laughs> yeah, but he really did enjoy listening to what you had to say. And also, you know, um, he had spent most of his life as a, a missionary in Nigeria. But I'll take it. Yeah. <laughs> and then, uh, Joe, I, I was talking to some younger Dominican friars, and they, uh, I think most of them said they actively listened to your channel and enjoyed your content. So you That's do awesome. have friends in the Dominican order, both of you. So <laughs> I already knew thank you yeah, so yeah, much. I, yeah, because I, I, I went to Catholic schools and whatnot. So I've got, I've got lots of uh, connections there with my past. Um, yeah. All right. Thanks. Well, thank you so much and uh, have a great day, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Swan. Thank you, Joe. Appreciate it. Yeah.